The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. For decades, manufacturing thrived here in Ontario, bringing good paying jobs and fueling economic growth across the country. But in a little over a decade, what once boomed has shed hundreds of thousands of jobs. Tonight, where we stand and how a rebound might not be as far off as it seems. Then, a chilling conversation about the baffling and bizarre phenomena of people who disappear, often without a trace, every year in the wilds of North America. It's Thursday, December 3rd, and that's next on The Agenda. In his speech presenting the Ontario budget last month, Finance Minister Rod Phillips praised the manufacturing sector in this province, saying, quote, Ontario remains one of the world's great workshops. But since manufacturing's peak, more than 350,000 such jobs have been lost here. That got us wondering, how true is it that we're still a manufacturing powerhouse? With us to help find some answers to that, and as is our custom, we'll introduce them from furthest away to closest to our studio. We welcome, in Sudbury, Ontario, Tom Fortin, director at both OnTrack Control Systems, an electronics design and manufacturing company, and at the Fortin Discovery Lab, which encourages young people to get involved in manufacturing in Northern Ontario. In Guelph, Ontario, Linda Hassenfratz, CEO of Linamar Corporation, whose 2019 revenues of $7.4 billion makes them Canada's second largest automobile parts manufacturer. And in Hamilton, Ontario, Wayne Luchuk, Professor Emeritus at the School of Labour Studies in McMaster University's Economics Department. And it's great to have you three on our program tonight. I do want to start by just showing a couple of charts which will help set up our discussion. And uh, since we have a number of people listening to us on podcast, I'll describe these in a little bit of detail here. Mm -hmm. The first one goes back about four and a half decades. And if we go back to 1976, we see that the share of Ontario's jobs in manufacturing was almost a quarter. But then as the years have ticked by, the numbers have dropped and dropped and dropped, and we have shed more than half those jobs. Manufacturing as a percentage of the jobs in the province of Ontario today is just a tad over 10%, from 23, four and a half decades ago, to 10% today. Now let's do one more chart. We're going to look at the last couple of decades, and here's manufacturing as expressed as part of the percentage of Ontario's economy. And now we go back, you look at just, just 20 years ago, the year 2000, manufacturing as a percentage of our economy was almost a quarter. And where are we today? About 11.7%. So with those charts in place, Wayne, you study economic history. Could you take us back, describe how varied and diversified Ontario's manufacturing sector was when those graphs were way up in a place where we wanted them to be? Well, you know, those, uh, those graphs really only tell part of the story because you actually have to, go, you have to go further back to really understand the, the foundation of Canada's manufacturing sector. So after World War I, uh, Canada really was a global powerhouse. And that's in part because we were part of the British trading network. And that gave us preferential access over the Americans to the markets in Britain, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. And so actually, we were the ones making their cars, not, not Detroit. They were coming out of, out of Windsor uh, and out of, out of Oshawa. And that made us the second largest producer of cars uh, in the world. And that gave us the foundation where skills were developed, the infrastructure was developed for a manufacturing sector. Of course, we lost a lot of that after World War II uh, as other places started producing their own cars. And by the 60s, we needed the auto pack to even survive because we had a large, large number of plants that just weren't producing enough. And so the numbers you showed there starting in the, in the mid-70s are a reflection of the auto pack. And the auto pack really did give a boost to manufacturing, particularly in Ontario, particularly in cities like my own where I worked in Windsor, and the plant I worked at at, at, at the Ford Motor Company uh, where I made engines, which is very much an auto uh, 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 auto pack plant. What has happened since uh, is we have just lost sector after sector after sector. And if you think about Hamilton, where I live right now, we used to make elevators, we used to make Levi's, we used to make appliances, we made shoes, 
we used to make glass bottles, textiles and whatnot. It's all gone. And now the plant here in Hamilton where we used to make appliances, it's a green field. It's, somebody cuts the grass, but that's the limit of the employment. Well, let me ask you the bottom line question then. You clearly described a situation where manufacturing was the backbone of the provincial economy. Is it still? Um, no, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, the numbers you showed right there uh, indicated less than 10% of our, our GDP comes from uh, manufacturing. If you think about this in, in human terms, back in 1976, when about 4 million people were working in Ontario, almost 1 million of those were working in manufacturing. Today, about 8 million people are working in Ontario, but less than 800,000 of those are in manufacturing. And so people just don't look to manufacturing for a career. They're looking at other places in the economy uh, for a, a life. Well, I have a feeling that the woman who employs 26,000 people in 60 plants in 17 countries around the world may want to take issue with some of that. So, Linda Hassenfratz, tell us, for those who say manufacturing's on its last legs, you say what? Well, I couldn't disagree more uh, with everything you've just uh, heard. In fact, uh, when I look at our own organization, we have grown dramatically uh, over that exact same time frame. We've even grown dramatically over the last decade. I mean, if I look at our just our Canadian operations, because if we're going to, you know, focusing just on, on Canada, uh, our sales in Canada grew 76 percent over the last uh, seven years between 2012 and 2019. Our productivity increased 60 percent. Uh, our workforce grew by 40 percent. Now, admittedly, the jobs are changing. You know, we're doing more and more automation uh, on the shop floor. So we we tend to classify uh, our, our folks into two categories, direct employees who are people loading and unloading machines. Uh, and indirect is everybody else. I'm an indirect worker. Uh, so are folks in logistics or, or administration or uh, maintenance, et cetera. So our, our numbers have changed a lot. So as I mentioned, since 2012, our overall workforce in Canada by 40%, but we've increased our indirect workforce by almost 70%. Our direct workforce has grown as well, but only about 20%. So you can see that the, the face of manufacturing is certainly changing. Uh, and to me, uh, in my opinion, there's never been a more exciting time to be in the manufacturing sector. And I would strongly encourage people to indeed look to the manufacturing sector as a place to build uh, a career because there are a lot of exciting things going on, uh, a lot of exciting jobs uh, to be had, and we're doing a lot of important things in terms of coming up with solutions for some of the world's biggest problems, whether it be uh, climate change or bringing you know, clean clean water or food to a glo growing global population, manufacturing is who's coming up with those solutions. So if you want to be part of that, uh, you should join our industry. Well, let me do this follow-up with you, Linda. Is it fair to say that while you and your company have done extremely well, the overall picture is, as Wayne described it, much less buoyant? <clears throat> I wouldn't agree 100% because I think like anything, uh, you know, a statistic is made up of, a variety uh, of sectors. So I would say the automotive sector, the automotive supply sector is one that uh, actually has had a lot of growth and opportunity. We're not the only company uh, who uh, who is growing and finding new opportunities for our Canadian uh, workforce in the auto parts uh, sector. We've also dramatically grown our Skyjack access business. So another market where uh, we are, are growing our business, like to me, you grow your business by being competitive. And you are competitive when you're investing in innovation and when you're uh, efficient, when you're improving your productivity, both of which we are doing uh, in space, which is why we're growing our business uh, so well, but a lot of other companies uh, are as well. And, and I think a big part of it is because the manufacturing industry in Ontario, in Canada, has really evolved uh, over the last 50 years. We've uh, become more and more a technology company, in fact, by virtue of all this automation and uh, the power of computing and what we can do uh, in terms of automation that we couldn't do 
let's say even uh, 10 years ago. So, you know, what we're seeing is uh, in Ontario, we already had this incredibly strong manufacturing sector. Uh, at the same time, over the last 10, 15 years, has evolved an incredibly strong technology sector in uh, Ontario as well. I mean, we've got, you know, the second highest density of technology startups in the world uh, right here in Ontario. And what's happened is these sectors have intersected. So we now have what we call advanced manufacturing, which is really, you know, an, an intersection of the, this technology expertise along with this uh, strong manufacturing expertise to turn Ontario into one of the world's strongest hubs globally uh, of advanced manufacturing. Okay, Tom, let's get you into this discussion here. And I want to put the quote that we started this discussion with from the Ontario Finance Minister, Rod Phillips, when he said, quote, Ontario remains one of the world's greatest workshops. Agree or disagree? Well, I'll agree. It's a, it's a great workshop, but that's really only half the picture of what you need to build a, a, a manufacturing economy. Um, you know, and by a workshop, you're implying the, the, what we're talking about is we have the, the labor and the skills to, to manufacture things. And like I said, that's only half the equation. The other half is, is, is advanced manufacturing. And so um, if you look at, you know, the decline in manufacturing in Ontario, it's, you know, if you're a consumer, it's been apparent to you. If you pay attention to where the things are made that you buy from a bit, it would be clothing or electronics or, you know, in Ontario, we, we used to make all of our telephones and then we used to export them all over the world in the, up until the, the, the mid 80s, but they had wires connected to them. And so, um, you know, the loss in jobs is due mainly because of, you know, offshoring uh, production to lower wage countries to, to, be, to be more competitive. And, and it, it wasn't that uh, com countries weren't buying things from us. It's just that we were making large parts of the, uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the whole product in other countries instead of manufacturing them here. And uh, the consequence of that is, is, is very bad. And then Linda talks about advanced manufacturing and she's right, it, it, you know, that's a very important component to building a manufacturing economy. But by offshoring our production, you know, for example, let's look at batteries for uh, electric cars, lithium batteries, you know, they're, they're invented in uh, the United States. Uh, the, 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 the technology was uh, uh, commercialized in Japan, but almost all lithium battery production for the last 20 years has been done in China. They have a huge part of the market and that's because of American companies like Apple and even BlackBerry, ex, you know, offshoring production to China. And the way you get advanced manufacturing is you manufacture things over and over and over. And so China, as a consequence of them doing the manufacturing, has developed the advanced manufacturing skills to make these devices. Well, let's put up a couple of stats here that uh, will, again, propel our discussion forward. Uh, Sheldon, middle of page three, if you would bring this up. Ontario still accounts for nearly half of Canada's entire manufacturing output. And since 2010, advanced manufacturing industries have generated half of the more than 45,000 factory jobs created in Ontario, and factory output rose 16%. So, with that in place, Wayne, I think the fact is, years ago, Ontario, Ontario making things was a big part, as you indicated, of our identity around the world. Um, it was an important part of the, of the face we presented to the rest of the world. Do you see manufacturing today as still a major part of Ontario's global identity? Well, I mean, if you put just the raw numbers, uh, Ontario represents exactly 1% of global manufacturing. So, I, I mean, I think that's just the reality. And I think the bigger question here is that the trend um, is pretty inescapable, uh, declining uh, employment and declining a share of uh, uh, GDP. I think Tom made the really important point that you figure out how to be better at something by doing uh, doing it. Uh, and the, the danger here is if, if the manufacturing sector continues to decline, then our ability to be really good at, say, advanced manufacturing becomes into question because we don't have enough experience. We haven't developed the skills. And so I think that, you know, there's a there's a there's a concern that at some point um, we might have might have that critical uh, amount of activity to allow us to thrive. Now, I think Linamar, look, there's no question, they, they deserve three gold stars. They've, they've done a fantastic job. I think the new announcements in, uh, in Oakville and in Windsor and uh, setting up electronic vehicles really speaks uh, highly to some future potential. But I think, you know, really uh, 
good manufacturing jobs are built on having lots of manufacturing jobs. And I think at some point, our, our sector may just be too small to sustain itself without a little bit of a boost from somewhere. Lyndon, do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I guess because uh, I look at it a little bit differently. I mean, uh, perhaps uh, manufacturing as a percent of GDP is less, but don't forget GDP has grown dramatically. You know, I mean, in that uh, time frame, GDP's, you know, doubled uh, in Ontario. So if our GDP or our percent of GDP for the manufacturing industry has dropped by less than half, then that tells me that actually manufacturing output may be up a little bit. So, you know, to me, uh, statistics, I'm a big believer in data uh, and facts, but I also try and look at not just percentages, but absolute values. Uh, and I also try to look, look at uh, understanding, you know, what what's being measured and how it's being measured before I leap to conclusions around uh, around what's happening. And a, a little bit like I was talking about earlier, uh, you know, you can't paint a broad brush and say that the same thing is happening across uh, every sector, you, you know, when you average uh, everything out, like without doubt certain sectors have uh, have declined uh, in uh, Ontario in terms of their, their relevance. Uh, textile is probably a good example where we did, you know, a lot of textile manufacturing, you know, 50 years ago, but uh, got, a lot of that went offshore. Now, on the other hand, again, I come back to the importance of technology and innovation as being a way to bring back uh, some of these uh, 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 industries. So for instance, uh, there's a company right here in Canada uh, called Mayant, super interesting company, developing what they call textile computing, which is taking tiny electronics and embedding them in threads. So they've developed a technology to do that, and then a technology to be able to knit that thread now into garments. Garments that can heat, uh, for instance, uh, that can track motion. Uh, and can be utilized in a whole variety of applications from healthcare to dealing with an aging population to you know a whole variety uh, of uh, of other areas so you know a really interesting example of how technology all of a sudden mm -hmm. you know makes it competitive in an area that maybe uh you know wasn't competitive when it was strictly based on uh labor costs so you know, I think we can't paint this broad brush to say, you know, manufacturing is in decline and, and not every sector is in decline. A lot of sectors do have some interesting uh, growth uh, opportunities. Uh, auto, this example on the, the textile side, it's a small uh, one piece, but uh, interesting. What's happening with food manufacturing? I mean, we've seen some uh, companies leave Ontario, but by the way, we've seen uh, others come in and others come back. Uh, there's a reason for that, you know, because we do have the skill base here. In fact, I feel like we've got a great uh, skill base uh, here that we've certainly been able to rely on and uh, use to uh, to grow our business. So, uh, you know, I think we do have what we need. And I would just caution against averages, right? Like if we're averaging out all sectors and then drawing a conclusion that applies to all of them. It's like, you know, having your head in the oven and your feet in the freezer, you know, on average, you're okay. But in reality, you know, not so much. Um, I, I have a mental picture in my mind right now of that, and it's very disturbing. You're quite correct. Um, okay, you know, Tom, my, um, my curiosity is getting the better of me now, Tom. You are, Sheldon, can we just go to a shot of Tom? You are surrounded by technology right now. How much of any of that technology in the background of your shot was made in either Ontario or Canada? Uh, virtually none of it. So, uh, you know, we, we really don't have a uh, electronic test equipment industry in Canada, and there's not really much left in the United States as far as, as, far as manufacturing. So, but just following on the technology side, you know, th these are tools, you know, and in Sudbury, you know, of course, we're a mining community and there's been uh, a lot of job losses due to automation, pretty much along the, 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 the data you showed in your graphs. Uh, but now I think the uh, automation, the job losses due to automation are basically uh, the large job losses due to automation going forward. That, that, that's all behind us. Now we're using automation and technology to develop 
new ways to do mining. So communications underground, remote operation, uh, uh, technologies that enable uh, deep mining, and all these technologies now, and we are generating jobs in the in 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 manufacturing these things in Sudbury, these these types of things in Sudbury. But what they're doing is uh, um, they're enabling mines to be uh, 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 makes lower grade ores more feasible. It makes the mines to you know by, by deep mining we can extend the life of mines, and so it's really you know the electronics manufacturing in Sudbury is really a tool to make us be the best in the world, and that's what advanced manufacturing and advanced process is process technology is about we have to be the best in the world at something to compete and we're doing that in mining uh, well we're on track to doing that in mining anyway well Tom let me do this follow-up when you see a product and you see the sticker on that product and it says made in China what goes through your head well I find it very frustrating because um, we have the competencies to build all these sorts of things here, but uh, because of economic reasons, because of labor, labor uh, wage inequities, uh, not that many things are made here. And, and, and it's not just the, the, the finished products themselves. We have a lot of companies that used to manufacture uh, uh, products here, but now only manufacture parts of the products where the complex and more expensive things to manufacture are made in Asia. And, you know, that's why we're seeing this de decline in, in, in jobs. And, you know, I, I try not to think about it too much because the more you think about what's what's happened over the past uh, years, it just makes you grumpy and then people don't invite you to parties. And so um, I like to look forward and think, OK, here's here's where we are. And uh uh, let's start talking and let's start moving forward about how to uh, how are we going to compete in the future, you know? And, and I think the answers are in specialization, in advanced manufacturing, and so on. Like if you look at innovation, it doesn't matter what industry it is, whether it's mining or automotive or uh, 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 medical devices. And, and, and I'm not talking just about the products, uh, the innovation in in how things are manufactured. It, it comes down to three things: electronics, sensors, and uh, uh, software. And uh, these are the things that are the disciplines we have to focus on uh, to add competitiveness, not just for the electronics market, but for all the associated, manu all the manufacturing uh, sectors. So, Linda, do you get grumpy and not get invited to parties when you see Made in China? Um, I get invited to parties all the time, so maybe it's my sunny attitude. Uh, but uh, personally, I, I, I don't think it's a problem. Here's why. I believe that you're competitive when you're innovative and you're efficient, right? So you need more to compete on than just labor costs. So the more technology we can put it into products, and that doesn't mean they have to be specialized products, only, you know, some kind of niche market. It means that you've put technology into something to give it, uh, you know, more, a better performance uh, to improve the cost potentially to, you know, improve some other element uh, by virtue of the technology and, and the innovation. And then all of a sudden, you've got a new playing field from a competitive perspective. If you're only competing on, on labor costs, of course, it's going to be tough to compete with low cost uh, labor regions of the world. But by the way, I wouldn't actually put China in that category. I mean, we have facilities in China which serve the market in China. Uh, so we've always approached our manufacturing from a sort of localized perspective. So our plants in North America serve customers in North America. Our plants in China serve customers in China and our European plants uh, obviously serve our European uh, customers. So, you know, because we've grown to the size we have, we've been able to uh, have that kind of, uh, of, of a structure uh, in place. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have, so I look at the, the evolution of our costs in China. I mean, uh, labor costs in China today are dramatically higher uh, than what they were uh, 20 years ago when we, when we first went to, uh, to China. So, I mean, labor costs are, are increasing at, you know, 15, 10 to 15% per year. So, you know, the, I, I would not characterize China by any uh, stretch as low cost on the labor side. Other parts of Southeast Asia are becoming, you know, are, are you know, more on the low cost labor side. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, again, it's got to be a combination of uh, the technology and the labor. But what's uh, interesting as well is auto automation is completely changing the playing field again when it comes to manufacturing because all of a sudden 
the labor piece is becoming a lot smaller, right? Uh, you know, if you're uh, autom uh, automating more and more, uh, then all of a sudden the labor cost doesn't actually matter as much because you have less of that direct labor uh, out there, you know, doing that loading and unloading of machines. Uh, so it kind of levels the playing field again in a very uh, different way. Hmm. And it's quite interesting because as I say, we have these plants uh, in China and we are automating uh, as aggressively in China mm -hmm. as we are in North America or in Europe, uh, you know, partially because of uh, on the cost side, but also because uh, what we're finding is folks in China are just not interested necessarily in uh, a manufacturing job on the shop floor. They're more interested in those same indirect jobs that everybody else is, uh, you know, here in North America or, or in Europe. So we're automating just as much in China as we uh, as we are here. So it is kind of creating more of a level playing field on a global basis and really changing uh, changing the face of manufacturing around the world. Very interesting. Wayne, Wayne tell me this. Um, you gave us a long list a little earlier in our conversation of all the things that are no longer made in the city of Hamilton, which were 25 and 50 years ago. It's got a lot of people talking about reshoring, somehow trying to figure out how to get those industries that have left our shores, how to bring them back here. Is that a viable option in your view? Well, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a challenge. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves, um, what do we need to do in order to be successful at that. And I, and I think, you know, as, as most of you know, commentators have suggested, um, you know, we're not going to be just making things with screwdrivers and, and, and ratchets anymore. We're, we're going uh, upskill. And that raises the question, where do those skills come from? So I think what Ontario needs and what other jurisdictions have developed is closer links, say, between the manufacturing sector and the education sector to turn out some of those skills uh, that are going to need be needed in in this sector. At the same time, I think we need to sort of sort out our uh, the how how companies interact with government. So right now, someone coming to invest in Ontario, they've got to deal with a municipal government, a regional government. They got the province, they got the feds, uh, and you know, in places that are being successful are providing sort of one stop shopping where someone who wants to invest here can can come to a, 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 an office and get all those things sorted out and have some trust. Now we did a study of why Toyota located its second plant uh, in Woodstock. You know, a lot of people are saying, why would an auto cut firm come at all to Ontario given our, our labor costs? And what we found is what was really important in the Toyota case was a, was a level of trust between those who were making the decision to do investments and the local uh, officials who were gonna facilitate, how do you get water, how do you get electricity, how do you ensure that things aren't gonna change? And so that kind of trust relationship between government decision makers and investors, I think is really key if we're going to be successful in reshoring some of these industries. And I think the potential is there. I mean, we have smart people. Well, if it, you've just said it, and Linda just said uh, several minutes ago that we have talented people here, we have well-skilled, well-trained people here, uh, which takes me to Tom again. You, in the course of doing your work, speak to a lot of young people who are entering the manufacturing sector. You were telling our producer, Harrison Lohman, recently that you talked to a mechanical engineer, and I guess Harrison was quite dazzled by the fact that this mechanical ne engineer had never done what before? He'd never uh, you know, drilled a hole in a piece of aluminum or cut a piece of wood on a table saw, which... Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. I mean, the, the goal of our educational institutions or the, what the goal should be is teaching these young people how to learn and how to reason and, and these sorts of things. And it is a bit of a problem that uh, the, you know, the, the practical side of things seems to be overlooked to, uh, to a large degree. And I think that's more of a consequence of our society. If you look at the, what influences young people now, you know, now, you know, in the olden days, you, you know, you used to be kicked out of the house in the morning and told not to come home until supper time. And you went out and explored, you know, you made things out of wood and steel, you explored the woods and that sort of thing. Now the influence was, influences are there, you know, we have gaming, which is one of the major ones, which has, uh, you know, brought us uh, one advantage. We have a lot of people, uh, you know, becoming very competent programmers, but the hands-on uh, still seems 
seems to be lacking. And it's not that big an, an impediment, but it's something we have to work on is the, the practical skills. And that's what we're doing at the lab. The 14 Discovery Lab is, you know, we bring in these young graduate engineers and the goal is to help build it, make them competent and confident. And, and we're looking for engineers who basically have an entrepreneurial spirit because the goal here is, you know, in the product development lab isn't so much to create products, but to create competent entrepreneurial engineers so we can build this ecosystem or this critical mass of competencies in Sudbury to help us do what we're doing uh, with regards to technology, uh, not in mining. And, and there's been a lot of uh, good things that happened out of it. I mean, we're not just building mining products in Sudbury. We're building retail automation. We have three new uh, medical companies, startups, and so on. And this is all of a consequence of, of just uh, being, you know, doing our best to attract uh, the, the critical skills we think are needed to, to build this cluster in Sudbury. Right. We've just got a couple of minutes left here. And Linda, I, I'd like to go to you because we can't not talk about the impact COVID-19 is having uh, on the manufacturing sector and on your lines in particular. What are you finding? Yeah, I mean, for us, we haven't felt much of an impact uh, in terms of how we're manufacturing. Obviously, we felt a huge impact in Q2 when we were down for two long, painful months. Uh, but since uh, since coming back in mid-May, actually, our customers have been going full throttle, uh, and so have our plants. So we have 97% of our workforce uh, globally back to work, uh, and 97% of those are actually physically on, on site. I mean, as you might imagine, in a manufacturing organization, we need to all be here uh, in order to uh, to run our business. And in terms of uh, how we had to, to reorganize, uh, on the shop floor, not much, right? Because as noted, you know, there's more and more automation, so people weren't terribly close to each other to begin with uh, on the shop floor, other than maybe in some of the assembly lines. So, you know, we may, we had to put up some uh, plexiglass uh, dividers, for instance, uh, in order to, to make sure that we're uh, keeping people safe. So, you know, we've uh, we've been quite active in terms of putting uh, the uh, the right safety protocols uh, in uh, in place and it's working really well. So you know, distance or dividers, masks, uh, you know, it, it, screening before they come in, uh, you know, lots of hand cleaning and and sanitizing. Uh, and the good news is it's working. So you know, of course, you know, since we've been back to work in May, we've had uh, employees popping up positive. I mean, we have more than eight thousand people working right here. Uh, in Guelph, and, and we have, you know, a few cases maybe each week, but they're, you know, quite sporadic, and it's not spreading within the plant, which is what's really important to me. Like, I want our people to be, and I feel they are, safer at work than not at work, because here I can, uh, I we can police to make sure that the masks are being worn, that we are staying apart, that we're uh, creating a safe uh, working environment. So, uh, you know, we've had these employees pop up positive. We ask everybody around them to uh, to go home and get tested and and uh, wait for a result. And they, you know, they in general have been negative. So it tells me that the protocols work and that it is possible for all of us to work safely uh, amongst each other as long as we're following the protocols. Good. That's Linda hassan Fratz, who's the CEO of the Linamar Corporation. We thank as well Wayne Luchuk, Professor Emeritus, McMaster University, and Tom Fortin, who comes to us from Sudbury, Ontario, where he's the director of a couple of companies up there. Good to all of you to join us tonight here on TVO. Thank you very much. Here is a stunning, largely unknown fact. Every year, thousands of people go missing in North America's forests, woods, and mountains. And it's not for lack of effort by all manner of people who go searching for them. It's all laid out in a new book called The Cold Vanish, Seeking the Missing in North America's Wildlands. And it brings the author, John Billman, to our virtual studio tonight from Marquette, Michigan. John, I was just telling you before we went on, this is one of the spookiest books I've ever read. It is something about which I suspect very few people know. So let's dive in. What's A Cold Vanish, the title of your book? Well, you know, it, it's um, in, in this day and age, in the age of technology that we have available to us, that, that someone can just disappear 
um, with, without a trace is, is just still mind boggling to me. And like you say, people uh, just aren't aware of just how many people do go missing in uh, North America's wild lands and public lands. Well, the assumption would be it's a very small number. Do you want to reset our idea on that? Well, you know, in, in, in relation to the urban missing, it, it is still a small number, but the fact that, that you can go missing and there just are no clues left. Um, so conservatively in the book, uh, we came up in the states of uh, that there's still 1,600, um, at least 1,600 active uh, missing persons cases out there. Um, but but it's just it's much more than people believe. Well, let me read something here. This is from Kevin Fedarko, who did a review of your book, who writes, most of us prefer to measure and celebrate nature in terms of its tendency to delight, to inspire, to instill awe. But there is another metric by which the power of wilderness can be calibrated, which lies in its capacity to take us between its teeth, tear us asunder, and swallow up whatever is left with such ruthless efficiency that no trace remains. Now, you yourself spent months in the Canadian and U.S. wild researching this book. How much do we need to be reminded of the fact that, um, well, there are places in this world where we are totally at the mercy of Mother Nature, right? Absolutely, Steve. And, and you know, um, I, I, I think with the, the media and, 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 like I say, the modern technology, we're lulled, lulled into this false sense of security. But, um, you know, even the, the first world is still uh, really wild. And um, I, I don't want to say dangerous, but, um, you know, the, the cases in the book, having researched this, um, you know, it's, it, it's sobering. So um, I, I think it's both exciting that we live in a wild world still, but, um, but some caution is appropriate. Indeed. Well, let's go through some of the notable cases that you do uh, chronicle in your book. And let's start with Mitchell Staling. Who was he? Yeah, that's that's a really strange case, Steve. Um, da Mitchell Dale Staling was a, a, a Texas resident, 51 years old, and um, in 2013, he and his family were were just doing the typical uh, Western American tourist thing. They were visiting national parks in the West, and they went to uh, Mesa Verde National Park in southwestern Colorado. And and it's interesting because um, he became the only missing person in the history of that national park. That is bizarre indeed. Is there a working theory as to how he went missing in the first place? Their RV had broken down and they were just visiting literally the museum gift shop. And um, from the parking lot, you can see um, some cliff dwellings. And there is literally a wheelchair path paved to the dwellings. And it was, a, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it was a hot day. And he, but he, he wasn't planning on going far. And um, he got he got to the dwellings and then decided he would go a little further down a trail that was that was uh, a more rugged trail, but still very much um, you know tourist friendly. And um, some some tourists from Europe uh, claimed that they saw him, but that's the last that anyone had any contact with him. And you know he had a bad back; he wasn't prepared for for a long outing. Um, and you know uh, rangers searched for him thoroughly, and um, it, it's really strange that, that they couldn't locate him on that day. What's, what's uh, new about that case, in, in September, mid-September of this year, um, his, his remains were found, but, but the, the mystery uh, is still really deep on that case. Um, it, it's, it's unlikely where he was found. He was found in an area that had been very thoroughly searched previously, uh, seven years prior. And um, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but that same week that Dale's remains were found, um, the, the remains of, of 20 indigenous Native Americans were reburied. They had been taken to Finland in the 1890s um, by a, uh, an archeologist. And um, you know, it just so happens that um, the remains that uh, had been missing for 100 years uh, coincided with the discovery of Dale's remains, which had been missing for seven years. Let's do another notable case. Who's Michael Linklater? My, Michael is, uh, uh, that took me to Ontario, uh, northern Ontario at the Abitibi River. And um, Michael is uh, was a 44-year-old uh, Cree gentleman um, whose family reported him missing in 2003. And um, that's another really strange one because um, uh, some people think that he's still out there in the bush 
uh, alive and just doesn't doesn't want to be found. I spent uh, 10 days up in the bush of northern Ontario with a with a, a searcher who specializes in cold cases in really remote places, uh, searching searching for Michael. And we found some clues, but we 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 didn't we didn't find him. What does his brother still do to this day? Leaves leaves food and uh, and warm clothing out for him. So he clearly thinks he's still alive. Yes. Yeah. Is there any reason to believe that he is? Um, y yes, he's a he's a keen survivalist. He um, he he's uh, a hunter trapper. Uh, if anyone can survive out there, it would be Michael. Now, admittedly, this question's a little grim, but let's do it anyway. Here, when the corpses of the missing are found, they're very often unclothed. Why would that be? Yeah. Um, People suffering hypothermia oftentimes will shed their clothing, Steve, because they they feel like they're actually burning up. They're 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 feverish and very very hot, and um, so so searchers will sometimes find articles of clothing, and that's how they can track somebody. But the real mystery is, you know, what led to the person succumbing to hypothermia in the first place, and that's that's largely the unanswerable uh, part of of that condition. There's another oddity as well, which is sometimes when bodies are found, they are found in areas that have already been searched or right beside a trail where people have walked by and yet somehow have been missed. How does that happen? That's a great question. I wish I wish you could tell me. I, uh, you know, I, I feel like Dale Staling's case in Mesa Verde was one of those cases. I mean, they, um, it, it sounds like where they did find his remains, um, he, he should have been spotted from the air in those first couple of days of the search. Um, that is a really strange phenomenon, and it happens. Um, it happens repeatedly, and uh, I just, I just don't know the answer to that. It's a mystery. There are people who are, for lack of a better expression, just hell bent on searching for missing people. And I want to talk about, or have you talk about one of them right here? There's a woman you describe in the book who drives nine hours round trip every weekend to help search for someone. There's another guy who spends every spare hour he's got going into the bush looking for people. He offers thousands of dollars of reward money. It's his own money. These people are not related to the people who are missing, and yet they do it. Why do they do it? You know, I've, I've learned throughout the research of this, Steve, there's a, there are so many people out there with huge hearts, and they, and they want to put their skills to use in, in helping these families. And, and the, you know, the story that, that really doesn't get told when it comes to missing persons is you know the people who are left behind and and I feel like um, I feel like largely these people who are dedicating their 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 finances and their time and their their skill sets um, in, to to finding some answers um, are, are really doing it largely for the for the families. And we're not just talking about people out there you know putting their hiking boots on and going out for a few hours. Talk about some of the the lengths to which they'll go to help search. My, um, Michael Niger lives here in in Marquette County, Michigan, and that that's a that's a that's a strange happenstance that uh, uh, I tried to find someone with his skill set who who was as dedicated to him who searches in the remote territory that he does, and I couldn't find anyone anywhere. Um, he spends a lot of time in Ontario. Uh, he has a lot of cold cases that he's still working on, and many of them are on the North Shore of Lake Superior and um, and throughout Ontario. But um, you know he he is a he's a retired Michigan State police officer, and um, extremely physically fit. And um, he he leads uh, wilderness trips in um, extreme winter weather, uh, ski trips, canoe trips, and so he's he's very very qualified for this. And he happens to apply those skills to going miles and miles into the bush, and in in awful conditions, mosquitoes or extreme cold. Um, trying to find some clues to uh, to give back to these families of missing persons. But you've got other people in the book who are using airplanes and helicopters and drones, and I mean, it, it's really quite incredible the lengths to which they'll go for people they don't even know. Absolutely, uh, you know, dog handlers, um, you know, people that that really, you know, um, I enjoy I enjoy cycling and and fishing in my spare time. These people enjoy um, training. And um, and and going out into these remote places, uh, looking looking for answers, and, and and again, you know, to help families. 
Well, speaking of helicopters and those kinds of rescue items, uh, let's give our viewers a sense of some of the ordeal that these people go through when they get lost. And this is the story of a woman named Amanda Eller. She was supposed to be out for a jog in Maui, and it became a 17-day horror show. Here's the story. She ate plants she didn't know and wild strawberry guava when she could find them. For protein, she swallowed an occasional moth. Maui waterfalls look fresh on postcards, but can contain leptospira, a genus of bacteria that causes a whole buffet of problems, including meningitis, kidney failure, and death. But to not drink meant certain death. She lost almost 20 pounds in those 17 days. In addition to her broken leg, Amanda had a severe skin infection from sunburn. She said she'd heard and seen several helicopters previously, but none had spotted her. I looked up, and they were right on top of me. I was like, oh my God, and I just broke down and started bawling. She had walked and crawled about 30 miles. This is one of those many incredible stories, John, you tell in the book. Uh, we do need to know, did she survive? That, that's a happy ending. That's one. That's one of the the several happy endings. Yes, Steve. Um, she did survive, and um, th that's a, that's a great story. Not only for her strength and, um, and 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 you know just commitment to to not perishing in, in the wilderness, but the uh, the people that rallied and um, stayed in the search camp after the official authorities had abandoned the search. How'd she go missing in the first place? She was out for a, a run. Just a, she didn't plan to be out long. Just um, just an outing in, in a in a familiar part of uh, part of Maui where um, she just liked to go and um, got turned around. And that that happens. You know, I, I get turned around in familiar um, familiar country near my house. And, <laughs> and um, you know, nobody thinks they're gonna gonna get lost or turned around. And it just it, it just happened. And um, one of the things that can happen, especially a fit athlete like Amanda is um, you know, when you're determined that you're headed back the right direction, you can um, very quickly put the miles underneath you and um, become much more lost. Yeah, there, there are so many different degrees of horrifying in the stories that you tell. I mean, getting lost and feeling helpless is one. Getting lost, feeling helpless, looking up in the sky and seeing a potential rescuer not see you fly by, that has, I mean, what do people tell you about the level of just deep angst they feel when that happens. Right, well, that, uh, that almost happened to Amanda. That, her case is in some ways a miracle because she was spotted, spotted by a helicopter. The helicopter was running low on fuel. They were getting ready to turn back around. They, they, just, they were doing a scouting run. They weren't really um, actively searching in that area. They were looking for uh, the, the ground that they were gonna search in the next couple of days. And so um, it, it, everything fell into place, and, and it, you know that's that's about as close to a miracle as you can get. But yeah, um, yeah, the emotion that, that she uh, that she went through is just um, uh, other human. Mm -hmm. We do need to talk about the families that are left behind, even if there's a happy ending. There are families that go through you know lengthy periods of time where they don't know what's going on, and you describe an emotion that they go through. You describe it as frozen grief. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, there's a, a psychologist uh, named Pauline Boss who um, who also calls it um, am ambiguous loss, and and she says that it's the it's the hardest thing that a human being can endure. Your loved one is missing, and you don't you don't know why, you don't know where, you don't know how, and um, it, it's just you know having spent time with with the families, especially um, Randy Gray, the father of. Uh, a sort of the main case in my book. Um, it, it, it's I, I don't, as a father myself, I don't know that I could I could uh, endure what some of these families do endure. So it says a lot about about human strength and heart. Well, you should uh, you can go into some detail there. His son Jacob Gray went missing, and Randy basically said what? He he said I'm I'm going to find my son, and and um, you know it's it's interesting you know. Um, I, I, I see families split between, when they don't know what happened to their to their loved one. They don't know whether their their son or daughter is is alive or, or have perished. Um, you know, there are optimists and there are pessimists. And um, I understand the pessimists, but Randy Gray um, is my new model of of the ultimate optimist. He would wake up every morning and and just uh, say, "What am I going to do to find my son today?" He, he liquidated his, his successful construction business in California, essentially moved into a camper 
uh, a mobile a mobile home and and hit the road and um, we spent time in in Washington State and Western British Columbia and um, I, I've never seen a human being with so much um, determination and dedication. How did Jacob go missing in the first place? J Jacob was a, a keen surfer and athlete and he'd just gotten into touring cycling so he uh, he was planning on a cross-country trip from Washington State to Vermont and um, he was preparing gear and doing some test runs and he had loaded up uh, his bike trailer, a, a, a renovated uh, child carrier, full of camping gear. He had fishing rods. He had a, he had a bow and arrows. And um, he wasn't planning on going fast. He was just gonna he was just gonna live live off the bike. And uh, he went out on on what they think was a test run in a storm one night in April of 2017. And Rangers discovered his bike and trailer and gear along the Soul Duck River in Olympic National Park. And um, that's all they knew. And the early assumption was that he somehow fell into the river and, and, and drowned. But his father, Randy, knowing that Jacob was such a, such a, a skilled surfer, um, for, first of all, doubted that theory. However, Randy himself was a, is a, an elite level surfer and um, it, it was something to see watching how he and his friends searched that river. Um, they literally overturned every rock at the bottom of that river. And so what they could do then is eliminate the probability that Jacob perished in the river, he's somewhere else. And so um, Randy believed that his son, you know, son he was athletic, healthy, strong, smart, he was out there in the world and just um, on a walkabout, he called it, and didn't didn't want to be uh, didn't 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 want to be social for a time being, and so um, that led us uh, not only in the park but outside the park, uh, searching for his son. And Randy never had a day where he thought, "My son is probably dead, but I'm going to keep looking anyway." I, you know, I he he may have, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it, you know, um, from, you know, sun up to till past sundown, it was, um, we're going to find Jacob. He would talk about Jacob in the present tense. When I find Jacob, I'm going to give him back his surfboard. I'm going to give him this camper. Um, you know, it was really, uh, Randy Gray's spirit is, um, is pretty incredible. It's interesting. You say they talk about their kids in the present tense. Do they, if the, if the children are not found, do the parents ever stop talking about their kids in the present tense? I believe Randy Gray would still be talking about Jacob in the present tense. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and you know, what what effect does time have um, years and years and years after someone has gone missing? Um, I I don't know that anyone ever gets used to to the idea. Um, but I know Randy Gray uh, would still be talking about Jacob in the present tense. It is completely understandable that some parents turn to the supernatural world for answers, such as what? Well, in, in, in Jacob's case, Bigfoot. And, um, you know, he, he, of course, social media comes into play and um, the, the Gray family got a Facebook message from uh, a Native American and indigenous woman in, in Washington state who lived at the base of Mount Rainier. And um, she claimed to have uh, spoken to a family of Bigfoot who, who knew where Jacob might be and so, you know, the one thing, Steve, you'll do when, you're, when your son goes missing is you'll, you'll follow leads that, um, you know, previously you would think were, were wild hairs and just, um, you know, make-believe. But, but when, you have, when you have few other things to go on, you'll go meet with a woman who claims to, to speak with Bigfoot. And, um, you know, that, that was interesting. That, that didn't lead to anything. But... But we did uh, we did have help from Bigfoot researchers who were incredible in the the assistance they gave the search with their with their knowledge, with their athleticism, their dedication. Um, so I came away from it with um, you know I think I went into this as a skeptic and I came out of it just with a with a tremendous respect for um, these people who who believe in 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 things um, 
that you, you could assign to the paranormal. John, half of me thinks we ought to tell people what happened ultimately with the Gray case, and the other half of me thinks, well, you know, it, it's kind of the big mystery of your book, and we shouldn't give it away here. I'm in your hands. How do you want to play it? Well, yeah, we, you know, I, I wish that Randy could go on speaking about Jacob in the present tense, and, and unfortunately, um, that's not true. But they they do have some answers in what happened to Jacob, and I and um, I I think there is a sense of I hate to even call it peace, but there's there is a, uh, some sense of uh, you know what the proverbial closure that the family could have. Um, I guess I maybe won't go into how how he was found, but um, but he was found. And the story did not have a happy ending. Right. Just finally, you wrote that you you dream about these missing people a lot. That's what you said. Do you still? I do. I, oh wow, um, Steve. I wish I could turn it off. And um, uh, two nights ago, I yeah, I, I um, it, it, it's frequent. And um, um, I I think probably I'll I'll always have these dreams. And and like I say, I you know I. I can't claim to have gone through anything like, uh, like say, Randy Gray. And so, it, it, to me, it's still unimaginable how, how a human can endure that. Yeah. Well, um, John, we've had thousands upon thousands of guests on this program, but I'm pretty sure I'm on safe ground in saying we've never before had a guest that lived in a log cabin on the Chocolay River in Michigan. So you are a first, no doubt about it. And this story is I amazing. I, I'm honored. I, I really appreciate it, Steve. Not at all. The Cold Vanish, Seeking the Missing in North America's Wildlands. John Billman. Take good care, and thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. With COVID-19 vaccines beginning to come on stream, tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka finds out what capacity Canada has to manufacture what we need here at home. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.